Well, hi again, folks. I'm Greg Flynn, and welcome to this edition of This Week in Pearl. We have a very special edition for you as we're going to spend an extended amount of time with our Lieutenant Governor, Delbert Hoseman, as well as Senator Dean Kirby, who are going to give us a rundown on everything that's going on under the dome at the state capitol and some of the plans they have for next year's session. We'll also take a look inside the Mississippi Braves as the M-Braves just uh, finished up their first homestand of the season, and it is great to have baseball back in Pearl, Mississippi. All that and more coming up on this edition of This Week in Pearl. Hello, I'm Mayor Wyndham, and I'm thrilled to show you the city creating its own future. Pearl is located in Rankin County, the fastest growing county in Mississippi, and there's no question why. Access to great schools, even better shopping, and unbridled beauty make Pearl a town that truly embodies its name. And with a truly exceptional team of first responders, public safety is another key component of our success. With fantastic housing opportunities from quaint suburban neighborhoods to gorgeous lakefront properties, there's a place for you here in Pearl. You can't beat the location. Right outside of Pearl is the crossroads of the south where Interstate 20 meets Interstate 55. From here you can travel anywhere within the state or the country. Or you can choose to stay right here in Pearl to enjoy a Mississippi Braves baseball game or experience the small town atmosphere, community pride, and heart of the local residents. Welcome back to This Week in Pearl, folks. I'm Greg Flynn, the Public Information Director here for the City of Pearl. And we are honored now as we go under the dome inside the state capitol. We are joined by not only Senator Dean Kirby, who we all know, but... Look at this fella. We have the <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman here with us. Man, we are honored, sir. I'm honored to be with both of you guys, man. This is awesome. Man, that is uh, fantastic. Um, first off, I want to ask you, we haven't had a, a chance to catch up in a while. How's it been um, going since COVID and all these yeah. crazy things going on, not only for how you work in the Senate, but just your state perspective as a whole? Well, last year was... There wasn't. A, there is no other year like last year. Uh, we started and stopped three or four different times. Uh, Dean and I were in many meetings trying to schedule when we could come back. Uh, we gradually stretched out till June, and then we both got COVID and uh, we're down for about two weeks, and then we kind of come back again in August and finally in October. So never been a session that dragged out that kind of length of time, <clears throat> and. In some ways, it, it's been hor horrific because of the pandemic. So many of our legislatures had the pandemic and so many of our people did and the uncertainty and trying to get people vaccinated. And when we got the vaccination, just a very, very difficult time. And in the middle of that, we addressed all kinds of matters from uh, $1.2 billion that were given to us by the CARES Act uh, to uh, addressing a new flag for Mississippi, which was put on the ballot and adopted by the citizens. So there was, there's a lot going on, and we were not bored last year. No, certainly not, but it's uh, your, your perspective. Dean has told us many times that he's confident and feeling better each week as we get through mm -hmm. the pandemic, that vaccinations are increasing, um, testing still mm -hmm. available wherever you need it. Mm -hmm. Are you feeling that we're getting to a good place? We are, and I noticed, um, you know, at some of the events that you go to, like the baseball game or whatever, you see uh, more and more people coming out. Uh, I want to emphasize this. We're only about 40% vaccinated. Now, we need about 20 more percent of our individual uh, residents here to get vaccinated. Now, clearly, the vaccinations have been going on about four or five months. Uh, they had uh, some problems with the Johnson & Johnson, about six deaths, I think, out of about five million given. But there is no reason not to take the vaccination. That's for your own personal protection and your family and your wife or husband's protection. We need to make sure we continue on, even though we seem to be coming out, I think, of uh, the pandemic here. Uh, the real key is to be complete. We're, we're in the fourth quarter and we're near the goal line. So let's don't fumble right here. Let's keep going. And I, I think that's real important. Uh, I think um, our economics are staggeringly good for the state. Uh, Dean and I particularly worried, spent many hours going over what the result was gonna be of a pandemic. Uh, we thought people laying off, 
I mean, we we're conservatives, and so we didn't want to get have the state where we had a problem. We have a rainy day fund that Dean before, before I got here had fully funded it, and so we had good money in there, but we didn't know where, how how big a catastrophe this is going to be. Well. It's quite the contrary, with Congress pouring money in here, and I think our legislature spending it wisely, we actually have a surplus this year. Uh, we postponed the income tax to this year, our, our year, uh, the state's year. That picked up about $200 million and allowed our people not to have to file at the end of last year and allowed them to hold that money until June so they could get back to work. thought that was really important, and that consequently and some increases in revenue. Uh, if you drive around, you don't see very many cars on the parking lot. You don't. You can't find a Polaris or a side wheeler. Uh, you can't get your house built uh, for less about a third. It's about three times as expensive as it was before lumber, uh, appliances, uh, mobile homes are backed up six months in Mississippi. When I talk to mobile home deal, uh, construction people, so what has happened is we've had an explosion of uh, economics where we feared quite. Frankly, a, a health pandemic would lead to an economic pandemic, and actually the opposite has occurred. Um, with the latest uh, Rescue Act money, which will give Mississippi about 5.3 or 5.4 billion dollars in the next year or two, um, it's, it's going to be a staggering for what, what, what we'll be able to do. In the first one, you want me to talk about this? I mean, oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'd love you to, you to in, jump in. All right. in, the, in the first year that we got this, we got $1.2 billion to spend. Now, Dean and I and the members of the Senate just really worked and prayed over that a lot. How do we do that money? How do we use that money? And as it turned out, no state did better than we did. And those were, uh, first of all, we helped small businesses, about $200 million infusion into small businesses to keep them afloat until we could get to where we are today. That was a, a miracle. But then we reached out and spent $75 million in broadband to go to rural broadband. It was matched by the co-ops and negotiations we had with Michael Callahan and the co-op organizations. So they matched it. We took $150 million and started out all down the gravel roads and all over. Those have been phenomenally su successful. Their take rate now up, up in North Mississippi, as I've been talking to them recently, is over 50 percent, between 50 and 60 percent of everybody that goes by with cable subscribes. So their economics are working out tremendously well. We were one of the few states that did that. I think we were the only states that did that. So even while we were propping up small businesses in one area, we were thinking about the future uh, pandemics, and we were thinking about our kids having to do distance learning, and we're thinking about that's where the businesses grow, and that's where the subdivisions will be in the future here in Rankin County. You can see where that cable goes, and you can just about predict where people are going to go. In addition to that, we did a lot of other things, like we, we took $10 million and built ICU beds by December. Well, they were all occupied. ICU and negative pressure, they were all occupied. Uh, by the time we got them up and running, and that turned out to be literally a lifesaver. We put three or four hundred million back in the unemployment compensation fund. Now it's got six or seven hundred million dollars in it. It's almost back up to where it was before, and we, we spent four billion dollars on unemployment last year. But we were able to, with federal and ours, put back enough money to where we don't have to raise employers' uh, tax rates, so they were able to keep the same tax rates. So we, I, I would say clearly as you walk across, we gave food bank money, we, just as you walk across how we spent that money, I don't know that I would make any change in it looking back a year and looking at how it infused the economy and what it meant now that we have these surpluses, we postponed the tax date, so just a lot of decisions that were made on the fly with no, we know there's no roadmap for this. <laughs> no, there is not. So. One of the things I do want to uh, cover, you, you mentioned the, the unemployment, and Dean, I'd like to bring you in on this, is, you know, you drive around town all over Pearl, and you can just see now hiring. People just cannot find, our businesses can't find workers, and I don't know if it's because people are nervous to come back to work, or is, or do you believe in talking to folks, is it that additional unemployment stipend that's still out there that well, they're able to take. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that's why people aren't going to work. Uh, actually, I was on a Zoom call last week with some pro tems from other states, and I, uh, while we were on the call, uh, two of them and it, uh, made the comment that uh, their governor had just sent out uh, 
a bulletin that he was, uh, as of July 1, they were not going to accept any more federal money for unemployment. And t t so people would go back to work. Uh, that two of the uh, pro tem said that, and then another pro tem says, I've talked with our governor and he, we're expecting the same letter any day. Now I'm expecting the same letter any day, to be honest with you. I think the, the lieutenant governor would uh, would agree with that now, uh, and I don't ever speak for him. By the way, he does we'll pretty give good me job. We'll, give him we'll bring him in. Uh, but uh, uh, let me, since I brought that up, uh, what he said was we were in and out last year, and he, he's right about that. It was a never-ending session, as I've said before mm -hmm. here. It uh, ended what October or whenever it was. It almost uh, went to Halloween. <laughs> yeah, but what I didn't say was it was in and out for most of the uh, legislature. It was all in for him. He was there every day planning these things, doing these things, and making sure that Mississippi was taken care of. So it makes me feel good to go to work every day to, to work with someone like that, that uh, not only works hard, but expects everyone else to. And we, uh, you know, I, I told someone just this morning, if, if, if you like Mississippi, you'll love Delbert Hoseman. <laughs> <laughs> Because this is going to be a better place because of him. I Thank really you. believe that. Thank and you. and uh, we're, we're getting there. We're doing a lot of things uh, that needed to be done. Uh, the unemployment, I think, will take care of itself over time. Mm -hmm. It's just right now it's very difficult. You're right. I don't care what business you go in. It's not just Pearl. No, it's all I, over. It's anywhere. And I think it's nationwide, obviously. And we have the, the same problem. But that will take care of itself and we'll be back. Lieutenant Governor, is that uh, the perspective you think it's going to take care of itself? Because, man, right now it is just so hard to find get workers. It is, and uh, if you part of this, we we stopped uh, a lot of things immediately. So it's hard. Some of our workers that may have been doing X or have, have matriculated over to doing Y. So we don't have the same capabilities in restaurants and other places that basically just stopped. And now they're trying to get waiters back and on, and that lady or man may have gone and taken another job somewhere. So we've got, we've got shortages mainly in our restaurant industry, but also in, our, in other industries that I'll talk to. And I think Tate, uh, the governor, will probably be strongly looking at shortening the time for, uh, for our employee benefits. And then what that would do, of course, is that puts it back to where you would still get unemployment compensation, but you have to go look for a job. You don't just get a check. You'd have to uh, uh, go to the Unemployment Compensation Commission. I look for a job. I need some help. I would, just, I would go to a training course or whatever. So there's, there's a process to help you get back employable that they would get back into instead of just right getting a check no matter whether you did anything. Well, I mean, and it was highly necessary in the height of the pandemic. Very I know there was so. an extra $600 that went Very much to so. Mississippi. So you went from getting 238 or somewhere in that neighborhood mm -hmm. a, a week. You then were getting 800 uh, mm -hmm. something a week. Now they've cut that in half. It's back to 300 um, as an additional Plus stipend. hours, which is but, norm normally 100 to 200. So it's about 400 to 500 a week. So, I mean, and now it's slowly coming back down. But now mm -hmm. we can see people getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the heat of Mississippi is starting to come up and that the numbers are really, really dropping. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can get folks and not only get them back to work, but man, just help out our small businesses because they need it so much. Yeah, and I, when I speak to them, they're, um, what's happening is the normal, which is they're raising the rates for people to come back. They may have used to pay them $12, now they're gonna pay them $14. They're paying $14, they're paying them $17. So you're seeing people's hourly rate go up, which will be an inflationary matter at, at some point in time, which eventually you and I paid for. Uh, so there, there is some push there, and you'll see some uh, rate increases to keep good people and keep employees there working all the time. And this year, we got $5.3 billion to spend, and we have, uh, in addition to that, $3.4 billion for unemployment compensation that will be paid out, uh, uh, subject to, to the governor stopping it, say, in July 1st or August 1st. It goes through September. So. Um, the total take for Mississippi is nine billion dollars. So we have the same things that Dean and I worried about the last time will occur again. The states got one point eight billion, education got one point six billion dollars. Now the Pearl Pirates and Northwest Rankin and all Brandon and all our friends out here 
they got money, including the private schools got money out of that. So 1.8 billion for the state, 1.6 billion for education, 400 million for institutions of higher learning like Heinz and uh, community colleges and university systems. Then in addition to that, we, the cities and the counties got $932 million. Now they come in two, two tranches, one just very shortly and one next year. You add up what the cities and counties and us have got, we got $2.7 billion to spend. So what I've been doing, and we'll be doing this week, and have in the last three or four weeks, is going and meeting with members of the Board of Supervisors and mayors all over Mississippi, from Cleveland and Greenwood to Tupelo to Columbus, Brookhaven, Natchez, uh, Hattiesburg, uh, Meridian, Pascagoula, all over uh, Gulfport. And I'm bringing in all of the Boards of Supervisors and the mayors. Now, we'll have our meeting here for Central Mississippi on May the 18th. And uh, we just just locked down the place, so we'll be calling everybody and giving plenty of time to come. But in that in those meetings, what we're doing is going over what you can use this new money for, which is water, sewer, broadband, and tourism. And we're asking the cities and the counties to aggregate their 900 million with our uh, 1.8 billion, so we can do some transformational things. We don't want to do things that are one and two years. Oh, we want to do things that are one and two generations going forward. So I have been real pleased with the cities and the counties. This is money that just printed in Washington, you know, whether we want it or not, it's coming. So I, they are actually putting it in savings accounts and waiting till Dean and, and the legislature comes back in January where we can start this matching procedure. Uh, obviously, Jackson has huge uh, water problems. Y'all are expanding. Your new West Rankin is coming on board. There's a lot of things happening over here as well, but there'll be a lot of that. And we'll need to make good decisions again on how we spend that money. So that's one. Then the Republicans and the Democrats are drafting a transportation bill. Now, y'all have been blessed here with increased transportation increase, but every time I go down Lakeland Drive, you can't go down Lakeland Drive. <laughs> so <laughs> so we're, we're still short out here. <laughs> because so many people moved here and your quality of life is here, your schools are good here. I mean, all lots of good things here. So people want to live here. So as, as we go forward, and Dean was uh, uh, very uh, active, I would say at least, in the uh, Pearl Richland Intermodal Connector, and, and it, which we, he got $2 million for y'all this year. Uh, there's several different uh, infrastructure things that the legislature is already going to do from money from last year. But this new block will be somewhere between $800 billion and $2 trillion, depending on who you talk to in, in Washington. And our share of that usually is about 1%. So if it's $2 trillion, I don't know if it would be $20 billion or something, some huge amount of money we'll get to spend on trans. That will be on transportation, which includes some green stuff. And there's all kinds of things. Hey, maybe they can finish Highway 49. That's a sore subject. <laughs> Personally. As you know, we uh, uh, Highway 49 has been going on forever. The initial bid was 147 million. They're 100 million dollars over. Wow! And uh, and it's not finished. Now, why why we got like that? That has been a, a matter of, of great discussion in the legislature, uh, by led by our Rankin County and our Simpson County friends that have to go up and down it every day. So I'm. Um, I think there, it just exposed to me some systemic changes that need to be made in how we proceed on road construction. So some of that has already started and we're, we're very hopeful. Well, we can't thank you guys enough. You mentioned the growth Rankin County and, and Pearl in particular. We're just getting so many more transportation arteries. You, you spoke about the, the uh, Pearl Richland Intermodal, which is not only going to help spur economic development just for public safety getting a bridge over the top of the train tracks down there at south pearson road so ambulances police fire can serve the communities whenever there is a call but man you're going to be able to get to highway 49 another way you That's know right. further down and we just needed these more north south connectors and the west rankin parkway is about to come online right here the pearson road extension which you'll be able to take all the way up into flowwood to treetops boulevard and then pretty soon, I know they the just... The dirt work has been done on that, and uh, Senator was very active in making sure we had enough money to finish that project. Because I've gone, gone out and looked at it, and it's, it's close. We're down to, like, the paving part. So well, and we're excited. I mean, that's we, we keep looking at the when those orange barricades come down and we can make that ride up to Lakeland Drive. 
Um, and then the other one that they just broke ground on, uh, the extension of the East Rankin, uh, right. East Metro Parkway, so you'll be able to come in from Dogwood and get all the way to I-20 on Crossgates. I mean, just so needed to get people, whenever there's heavy traffic on I-20 or accidents, you, we can now get people more north-south, right, Dean? Oh, that's right, and that's going to be a great, great deal, not only for Pearl, but for Flowood and Brandon. And, and you're exactly right. For those people that are going to Smith County, South Rankin, whatever, you can get off on treetops. That's the one you're talking about. And, and, and then go directly across all the way down past Cross Gates, across the, the uh, Highway 80, across the interstate, and hit uh, 18 South. So it, it's a, a great connector. And, you know, a lot of this, a lot of those people right now are taking 49 and going down and taking a left and going to wherever, Taylorsville, wherever it may be. They'll take this road now. If they're in North Jackson, anywhere, they'll take that. And, of course, if they don't take that one, they'll take this new one. So uh, the, the intermodal with Pearl Richland, which will put you in South Richland, and that's, that's going to be wonderful. Every time uh, I mention this, as we're looking forward to what's on the docket, uh, Dean likes to talk to us and he starts to sweat when he starts talking about, oh, we got the redistricting coming up <laughs> <laughs> following the census. Uh, so that, that's going to be a major task going forward, is it not? It is a, it, it is a major task, but it's not, um, it's not as complicated as it looks. We kept our four congressional districts. So Dean Kirby uh, was appointed by us as the chairman of the uh, committee for redistricting. So his first step will go will be to redistrict the four congressional districts. That's why Mike Michael Guest has now become such a good friend with yeah, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> so they close he calls every day. You know, okay. <laughs> no, I, I don't I don't see a, a lot of that movement on those, some nuances because we had out migration in the Delta, so there'll be some nuances, but they hopefully will stay close to where they are because they, they pretty much, um, like you've got a coast district and a delta district and a northeast Mississippi and a central one that, that Michael's a con con congressman on. And those are basically parts of Mississippi that are that are generally have other issues and specific issues to each one of them. So I, I'm hopeful that that won't take that long. Then it becomes much harder on Dean and the uh, committee when they start redistricting the House, and, I mean the Senate seats. And we have 52 of those to redistrict, and obviously we've had losses in some areas and gains here in Rankin County. You've had gains, and in uh, Hines County, there's been it's about even, although the city has lost a lot. The Delta is down a lot. There are probably I don't know about 50 counties that that have lost population, mm. and then uh, then others Rankin and Madison, DeSoto, Harrison, Lamar. All, all have have had increases in, in as people matriculate to jobs. So uh, I think it will be harder on him when we get to the 52. Uh, the <laughs> first four will probably be not too much. Look at him. You can see the beads of sweat already forming <laughs> on, yeah. the top, on the top well, of his head. You know, I've seen a preliminary map of, you know, and, and it, it looks like everything, uh, what west, I guess, of I-55 is lost population and everything east is gained yeah. so everybody's just shifting over so are you guys a little concerned though i know that on the the last census count the preliminary census count that uh, the state as a whole saw a net loss uh in population mm -hmm. uh, concerning some um, we uh, we're not good about sending our stuff back i think we had 67 percent of our people answered the questionnaire and then all the others were alleged to be called well you're calling old numbers so, uh, you know, I don't know that we had a loss in population. Uh, I, I think we probably had a small gain instead. I mean, they claim we lost 6,000, but I can guarantee you there's 6,000 phone numbers that were changed. And when we only had 67% of our people actually respond, you know, I got a 33% in here they're trying to phone and catch from numbers they knew a year ago. And so I, I don't know that we had a loss. I expect we probably had a small gain, but regardless of that, uh, the biggest problem, the biggest issue we have is making sure we have uh, uh, the economic reasons for people to stay and come here. Definitely. I mean, we have the per we have the best people in the world. Uh, we've got outdoor. We don't live in snow. Uh, I mean, there's a whole. We got water. A lot. A lot of the West doesn't have any water. Clean air. Clean air. Well, oh, we got all the things you want. Uh, Christian communities. No matter what faith you want to practice, uh, we have strong faiths in every, on all of them. 
Um, you know, we just have a lot to offer, I think. Uh, what we want to do is make sure our people are trained to do this work. And what that's come back to, we, we have about 30% of our kids get a college degree. The other 70% need a really good job. They need an economic life in addition to their personal life. The people that are here are just, there's no question that it's the best that we got in the country. So when you look at the economic life, what the legislature's done, last year we took what's called the SWIB board, which is 42 members, we shrunk it to seven, and we hired a workforce czar named Miller. And he is looking at all of the different courses that are given around the state to make sure that they cover the jobs that would be the jobs of the future and that are higher economic compensation. And so you'll see us like the uh, legislature put aside additional money for uh, computer training this year. Uh, we doubled, of course, we increased the salaries for, the, for teachers. Uh, we put a bunch of money in computers last year. We bought computers with our money for every, uh, or an Apple or a Chromebook for every child in Mississippi, 400,000 of them. So we got our workforce are now picking the jobs. He's doing that, going through that process, and then we're gonna reward that training for people who can get a really good job. Then we're raising our teachers, and I think we'll, you'll see some more studies to raise our teachers, continuing to raise them up to another level. That work will be done this year. Then this next year, we're looking at something called MFLEX, which is the Mississippi Flexible Tax Program. And what it does is it it emphasizes tax breaks for any organization that has 10 employees and invests two and a half million dollars. So what, what we realize, I think, our Toyotas and our Nissans, our Ingalls, uh, all these are great companies. Amazon came here, great companies. But where we can really keep and start, it would be to get that 50, 30, 80, 100 person uh, uh, factory or, or computer programmer or whatever we're doing get those people in here. They have, they'll grow externally and internally from that. It doesn't cost us as much money to get them started, and it keeps our people here. So our wheelhouse is at 10 to 200, and that changes uh, Pilahatchee, just like Multicraft did. Uh, it changes, you know, you look around, those people that hire those, those that, that number of employers that grow or whatever, that's where we want to be. So MFLEX will come out this year very methodical. First, get the technical part right. Second, get our teachers and our basic education, our computer programming right. Third, get our tax breaks right. And, and this is all done with malice of forethought. <laughs> I mean, we're doing it like we ought to be doing it. So I think the end result of A plus B plus C is, e is going to equal jobs and people staying here. So. Well, Dean, something that complements that very well is what the, you and uh, Gene like to talk about is our Heinz Community College, not only for the um, liberal arts degree or your general studies degree, but the technical training that's going on here that's available in Rankin County uh, for those exact type jobs, the robotics, the uh, computers, all those type things. That's true, and not only are we trying to do that with workforce training, but we also, the people are begging us to do it. So it's not just something that we came up with, it's something that everyone wants and and we're working on that, and, and uh, there's no doubt it's going to be for the betterment of the state and create a lot of jobs, a well, lot of jobs. Before we let them go, I have to tell them that, uh, you know, we all refer to you as the Energizer Bunny <laughs> because you never slow down. I mean, session's over and you're still going. Um, you keep a full agenda. I know this past weekend you were up at Old Miss giving yeah. a commencement address to the law school. We had a commencement address, and they gave me a robe and a funny hat and all that stuff, so I did that. <laughs> and uh, I wanted those kids to stay, those uh, young lawyers to stay in Mississippi. Then we met with uh, probably about 80 or 100 of uh, the boards of supervisors and the mayors talking about what we're going to do with that money. And a really good meeting late that afternoon. But no, we're, we're leaving about 7 in the morning and getting back about 8 at night. So, And a, a, a packed summer ahead for you? Yeah, we'll be doing the same. We've got a uh, national uh, legislative uh, podcast this afternoon to, that'll go all over about how we're doing things in Mississippi and whatnot and how we're addressing different issues. Looking forward to that. Then we'll be in DeSoto County and uh, doing our regional meetings with them. Um, then they've, uh, I've got to be back at the University of Mississippi. We, we're very interested in kinesiology and in uh, the, the teaching of individuals 
to deal with autistic children, Asperger's Excellent. and others. Dr. Rock up there has got a program. Mississippi State has a great program uh, that they're running, that they're building a new building for. We're very interested in that. So we're going to be meeting with them on how to expand that. One in every 50 kids now are born autistic, 55 kids. So there's a whole uh, generation of children. There's no, nobody knows why they're born autistic or not. Uh, it's just very unusual. So, but anyway, they, they have a lot of capabilities and we're trying to harness those and make sure that they live uh, their lives, their economic lives, as good as opportunities as you did or I did, the same ones that I had. So we're working on that on Friday and I, I can't tell you where I am Thursday, I gotta go look. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's so much. Well, I don't know about that. I just, it is to me, um, the clock is ticking. Every day that we can help Mississippi get a little better and there's so many things. Uh, everything we've met with uh, mental health to settle litigation, so we'll have our mental health capabilities up, expanded. Uh, we meet with people about mental health. We've got transportation issues that we're working on. Uh, we've got these um, autism issues that we're working on. We've got a tax reform bill that I, I want to start this, this year. Uh, we've got to address health care this year. Uh, that's been, you know, there's a uh, constitutional amendment pending on that. We're waiting on whether or not marijuana was legal or not. The Supreme Court's got to come to us court. As soon as they pull the trigger, we got to go one way or another. Um, so I would tell you, we're not bored. Um, there's a lot to do here, but if, if you're in the mix like this, you just see so many bright things that are coming in Mississippi. You know, our, our actually I told you, our people are, are the uh, major asset of our state. We are looking at uh, aggregating museums under the museum that we've got here. We're aggregating tourism. We have a great tourism. We've got a tourism budget. We've expanded that again so people can come and work here. We spent a lot of money on fixing up our state parks. Now, uh, that those state parks are fixed up. This year we put around three and a half million up and they matched it. So we got $7 million to fix the cabins and everything up, up to something and we're fixing to give them another $5 million to do water and electricity and whatnot. That's so Mississippians will have a place to go. Now it's a great, you know, people come here from all over and hook up their RVs and everything, but I wanna make sure that Mississippians have a place to go that is decent and, and we have let those parks go down. We're fixing to build them up a, a whole lot. I think total this year was about eight million eight or 10 million that we're gonna spend on getting those parks back up to death. That'll be a tourism attraction and it'll be a place for you to take your children, your grandchildren. So there's a lot of moving parts, but I think they're all moving in the right direction. Well, I can't uh, thank you enough, uh, us and the entire city for, man, what a team we have in the Senate. You're, uh, you and Senator Kirby, um, you know, just the strong conservative leadership, common sense approach that you all take up there. Um, we cannot we cannot thank you guys enough because I know it can be a rat race up there, right, Dean? It is, and if, if you're gonna be in the Senate, you better plan on working. Uh, that's true. If you're gonna be on the Senate staff, you better plan on working. That's the way we're, th that's the way our Lieutenant Governor wants it. It's the way we like it, and uh, we feel like we're making a lot of progress because of that. Leadership's everything, and, and whether it's in a business or in politics, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a great leader, and we know it, and w and because of that, we like working. I look forward to going to the Capitol every day. I, I know that when I go there, we're going to be working on something that's going to make a difference for Mississippi yeah. every day, and it's not the same thing every day, believe me. It's, it, we wear a lot of hats. And, you know, I, I'll tell you something else that, that we're seeing now. We're seeing... Uh, unity with the cities and the counties and and uh, and state all working together for a common cause. That's half the battle. And and, and you know that it is, and and it's really exciting. We've been doing that in Rankin County, and I think that's one of the reasons we've grown and progressed the way we have, is because as you know, like every three months we have a meeting with all the elected officials. Uh, well, can't have all of them. But the, they can't mm -hmm. have the open meetings act with supervisors. We'll have like two supervisors, but all the other elected officials, countywide as well as legislators, uh, and dealing and even education, all of us there together, and we talk about how we can help each other each time. And that's exactly the way that he's put together the state. How how can we help you while we're doing that? What can you do to help the state? Not just your city, and not just your county, but what can you do for us? And what can we do for you? 
and, and it's worked out really well, and I, I, I'm excited. I, like I say, I've, I've never been so excited about going to work. Well, I know it's going to fall on deaf ears, but can you pace yourself? <laughs> pace yourself for the summer. You know, sometimes we laugh, Dean and I laugh about this. The problem with common sense is it's just it's not, a, not that common anymore. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but thank goodness we got people that have had the history and are willing to stand up for something. So uh, it, it's really helpful. Our, our, your group from here, Josh Hawkins, Dean, all, all of them have been exemplary. And yep. Kaufman's got part of the South. Kaufman history. does and does a great job, yeah. and and of course Josh Harkins is doing a fantastic job for us as well. He's he's doing a great job as uh, as chairman of finance, and he's been very kind to us. And Pearl and Brandon and uh, Flowood, Richland, Puckett, Pilahatchee, Pisgah, all of us. I mean, he he works with all of us, and I appreciate he does that. A really good job. He was he's a good guy. He works really hard, and and I appreciate him very much. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time. Lieutenant Governor, you're welcome back anytime you need to get your well, message out. Oh, it's good to come and it's good to visit. When we get started here a little bit on the hearings, y'all pay attention. We'll be running hearings probably in June, July on all these issues. And the hearings are doing to get public input and it, they lead to legislation. So pay attention. They're all archived now, just like y'all do here. We we tape everything. Uh, we put them up at night. People can watch them later and that kind of thing. And there'll be tax reform. I mean, we, we're listening. So when you see what they're talking about, y'all give us input, particularly to, to Dean. He's the president pro tem of the whole thing. So <laughs> no. He's head of the rules committee. I mean, he's head of everything. Redistricting. Well, well, you need to talk to him. <laughs> we, we are speaking of redistricting. We're, we're going to have, I think, nine meetings all over the state yeah. during this year to, uh, to hear what people have to say about reapportionment of uh, congressional as well as their senate well, gentlemen thank you so much good to see you. enjoy your summer thank you we thank you see. so much yes dean try and keep that sweat down <laughs> uh, yeah. hey when we come back we will uh take a look inside the mississippi braves as chris harris joins me and we'll take a look at the first homestand of the year and where they stand going forward stay tuned more this week in pearl right after this WPBP and PMB-TV would like to thank our latest sponsor, Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts is located at 403 Riverwind Drive. With over 32 different types of donuts, they can take care of your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can now choose from their menu of sandwiches, wraps, and muffins. And don't forget the drinks. Along with coffee, espressos, and lattes for your morning drive, they also have soft drinks, cold brew coffees, and smoothies. The Pearl Pirates run on Dunkin' Donuts. All right, folks, welcome into Pearl's edition of the M Braves Insider. I'm Greg Flynn, and we are now joined by the Director of Communications and the voice of your Mississippi Braves. He is Chris Harris, and Thanks, you made Greg. it through a homestand. <laughs> we did in this strange new world of COVID-19 baseball <laughs> and all the protocols and everything. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we got to see, you know, almost 11,000 fans come through the gates at Trustmark Park and, uh, enjoy baseball for the first time in, in over 600 days. And I think that, you know, was what the, all the hard work and, and long hours was, was for, just to see those, you know, faces, you know, once they were able to get their masks off when they got to their seats and, and have a great time. And, you know, I think as the year goes on, things are going to, you know, become more smooth with, with every bit of the operation. And, and I just want to give a, a shout out to our, our staff, especially our game day staff, because, you know, a lot of those folks were asked to do, go above and beyond, you know, what they have been used to doing. And, and I remember all the tasks that were being done for games, you know, it was the first time they've done it in at least 18 months. So having to, to get back in there and, and do things, you know, uh, we're not necessarily a major league operation. So the yeoman's work that so many people did to make it possible uh, it got us up and running. And, and I think, uh, you know, that's that's a testament to a lot of people's hard work. Well, I tell you, it was from your perspective, you know, you sit in the in the broadcast booth. What was it like to not only see baseball back, but you hear the, the yeah. sounds and you smell the concessions and you can right. hear the fans? Right. I mean, it took a while for the fans to really get involved in the game because we struggled offensively a little bit there for a <laughs> while. But, um, 
you know, just seeing them react when the, when the fans, you know, when the players came out for introductions at the very beginning and, and um, you know, seeing them milling around the concourse, seeing them come through the gates. Uh, I, I think that's something we've always all been looking forward to over the past, you know, year and a half, two years and, and all the speculation and wondering, are we going to have a season? When's the season going to start? Uh, and then, you know, having, you know, some really engaged crowds is probably one of the more engaging uh, crowds throughout the whole series in the game pitch to pitch than that I've seen here in a long time. Um, you know, when we hit, you know, the, the two home runs by Shea Langoliers on Saturday night, um, just hearing the roar, you would have thought there was 10,000 people in there <laughs> instead of 3,000 or, or whatever it was. And uh, same thing on Sunday, on Mother's Day, one of the, honestly, one of the better Sundays I've, I've seen as far as just engage people there. We had uh, almost 100 Kids Club members show up for the first Kids Club Sunday, our family fun day. Um, you know, it, it was it was just nice to look down uh, and see that, and, and we got a lot of a lot of positive feedback via social media, and obviously from the prospect side, seeing what happened on Saturday and Sunday, a lot of people were. We had a lot of eyes on us this week. The city of Pearl did, the Embraves, and and you know I think for the most part we we came through. Well, talk a little little bit about the series. It didn't get off to how we started. We went <laughs> two and four uh, against a very who we made them look like a very talented team the Pensacola yeah. Blue Wahoos of the Marlins we made their right. pitchers look like Cy Young uh right. the first four games we went two and four and I think did you get a sense that it was the first four games as we lost them all was it cobwebs was it nerves was it guys trying too hard yeah I, I think it was a little bit of all those things you know I, one thing I, I've, I've talked to several of the broadcasters from around our league and from other leagues about you know what are you seeing you know what what's the the level of play like you know what's some things here and there and Pretty much in unison, all of them have said it's it's a bit sloppy. I mean, it really is. But you think about these players, most of whom, you know, didn't get the opportunity to play last year at all, and are coming back and playing with a group of people, a group group of players that you haven't really played with at all. And, and even in spring training, the ones who played together, you know, pitchers were separated from position players. The only time position players saw pitchers were when the game started. So. I think sloppiness was was something kind of to be expected, but you saw the flashes of talent obviously throughout the series. And you know, for us, I think we were just a little bit snake bit the first several games. You know, really nine of those runs we allowed uh, came in two innings, and just kind of had a couple innings kind of snowball uh, on the team. But you know, the way they played Saturday and Sunday, getting those back to back wins on the weekend, and really looking impressive, pitching well. And, and swing the bats well. That's what we kind of heard from spring training. It's a long season, 120 game season. Uh, nothing's decided in the first series. And uh, the big Braves started 0-3 this year. Uh, you know, won the division la uh, a couple years ago after starting, I think it was like 1-5. So it's the first series and uh, there were some positives, there were some negatives, but I think uh, for everybody, I think that was kind of the case. But boy, I tell you, Saturday, did they flip a switch. <laughs> All of a sudden, we started hitting with yeah. runners in scoring position, and the long ball is going to play a yeah. factor for this team. And yeah. you mentioned it before, Shea Langoliers, he came through with his first hit on Friday night, a double, and then back-to-back -back home uh, right. home runs and, and plate appearances. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about it last week on the show about Shea, his talent, number three prospect in the organization. Um, you know, one of the top catchers to come out of college baseball in quite some time, maybe since Buster Posey came out of Florida State. But, you know, we saw him, his de defensive prowess, he threw out all three base stealers that attempted. And then, I mean, you, you go back and watch those replays of the home runs mm. that he hit. I mean, Trustmark Park has statistically been one of the toughest ballparks to hit home runs out of. And those pitches that he hit went down to get, and he showed the pure power. That's impressive stuff. And, and, and for those to be... Uh, in those type of situations, you know, he had the solo shot. And then when Pensacola came back, tied the game at two, he comes back up with two on base, nobody out in the eighth inning and hits the home run. And you could just see the collective exhale from the entire team. Like, okay, all right, we're okay. We don't stink. Um, <laughs> but that, that's, that's, that's the team that we heard about. You know, this team's got a lot of power potential. And, you know, hopefully they don't become too reliant on the home run ball. And that's where you have – you know, table setters like Justin Dean and, and Braden Shoemake at the top of the order. Justin Dean, even though he didn't necessarily swing the bat real well, he still had an on-base percentage over 400, reached base all four times in a game on Sunday. So this is a team that's got a lot of great potential, and, and it may take some time for it to all come together, and we'll have to watch roster moves, you know, things coming up from uh, from Gwinnett to Atlanta and us to Gwinnett. But, um, 
I think fans are going to have a lot of fun watching this team and how they continue to to grow as the season goes on. Uh, how many home runs did we hit in the homestand? So we ended up hitting six home runs. Twelve of the 16 runs scored came on the home run ball. And uh, I think when you, when you look at the team statistically, I think there's a couple things that really they're going to have to uh, you know, work on and on the pitching staff side, it's it's walking too many guys. Oh yes. Um, you know, you walk 29 guys in the first five games. Um, that's tough. And, and and for the most part, you know, Pensacola didn't take advantage of a lot of those walks. Now they did in certain situations, but for the pitching staff, you have a lot of arms. I mean, we saw uh, five guys come out of the pitching staff throwing over 96 consistently. Um, so there's some great arms on the staff. I thought Victor Vodnik was was really really good. Uh, in the game on Saturday. I think he's going to be really special. The 21-year-old from Rialto, California. You had the veteran Matt Withrow, who was our pitcher of the week this week, uh, come through with a nice relief appearance on opening night and gave us a really nice spot start yesterday. So uh, the pitching staff, you know, as they continue to, to try and work on command issues, I think that's going to improve as the as the, the days go on, as they continue to get their legs back under them and pitching in, in, in game situations. Hey, you know, with the, with the power that this team is showing, we love when fans can win stuff. <laughs> and so we had our first Buffalo Wild Wings swing yeah. for wings guy right. come through and Jacob Pearson on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's the fourth batter that comes mm -hmm. up in every inning. If he hits a home run, everybody in the ballpark wins free wings over at Buffalo yeah. Wild Wings. And yeah. the player gets a $25 gift card. Yeah. And I know Jacob was, was ecstatic yeah. to get his gift and, card. And for Jacob, he had a lot of friends and family here. <laughs> He's from West Monroe which is just about two hours down the road. And, and so great for him. He was picked up by the Braves in the Rule 5 draft as, as a minor league uh, somewhat free agent, the Rule mm -hmm. 5 draft, uh, picked up from San Francisco. So being able to play here close to home as a part of the Atlanta Braves organization. And that kind of came out of nowhere. I'll be honest, it caught me by surprise a little bit. He was with two outs and, and that ball, none of the home runs were cheapies. I think most all of them, except for I think one was over 400 feet. Um, so they weren't cheap home runs either. And, and for Jacobs, I think it was 415. Yeah, Shea had one that was, I think, 390. 397. 97, mm -hmm. and it, it went right over yeah. the uh, Raytheon out there. Right, right. In uh, left center field. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice to see. COVID, are you learning to <laughs> adapt a little bit to yeah. get to know these players? Uh, it's, it, they it, seem to be doing okay. Yeah. I'm not, if Major League Baseball is listening, do this. I saw the, they were interacting with some of the fans on Sunday, yeah. and I just don't mm -hmm. think they can help themselves. They right. want to see the kids, right? It's, you know, they feed off that stuff. You know, as much as kids love to give auto, get autographs from players, players love to, to do that. That's, yeah. that's just part of the minor league baseball experience, and I'm sure they probably got uh, some sort of a reprimand by their trainer in the clubhouse, but I, whatever <laughs> it was, I'm sure it was worth it. Um, yeah, it, it was extremely different because you know, this is my 13th season in minor league baseball and really the first time, uh, you know, haven't had the opportunity to to do all my deliveries of stat packs and rosters and everything every day to the clubhouse because you all, you get that chance to, to communicate back and forth. And uh, the players were good about connecting with Zooms after the game and, and really good about that. Um, I think it's going to continue to evolve. I think those restrictions um, are going to, you know, slowly uh, phase away uh, in a positive way as long as things you know unless there's some reason to not do that but you understand why they're being so careful because you know we we want baseball if there's happened to be some sort of a, a, an outbreak with the team I mean we lose a Saturday night we lose a Sunday we lose a Friday night so we want those guys to remain uh, you know healthy and and in the best position they can, and, and vaccinations will continue. So, I, I thought I thought it was fine. It was kind of what I what I expected. Then, then maybe a little bit more of you know this is just really really strange and weird in certain situations. But I think we've all kind of adapted to a new virtual world in a lot of ways. So it you know, kind of offered more opportunities. I mean, I was able to to hook in almost immediately after some games and talk to Shea Langoliers after his two home runs. Talked to C.J. Alexander yesterday after his. Uh, home run in the first inning so that's a positive as well and and those guys you know they're they're with my job I've always considered to be to help those guys develop in the interview process as well and you know when they get to the big leagues they're going to have lots of microphones in their faces uh, right now it's zoom microphones but but still they're going to be put in that situation so it's good for them to be able to uh, answer questions after games uh, talk about their teammates um, 
and, and express to fans, you know, how they're feeling as well. So I've always considered that part of their development as well. And, and I've always really had, had good response from that. So that was fun to do as well. And, and maybe maybe in that regard, maybe even more so what I was expecting. And, and in the post-game Zoom and be able to talk to the players and get their reactions. But I think the fans really enjoyed that too. Oh, definitely. No doubt about that. So the players are off to Biloxi this week. Mm-hmm. Going to let the shuckers have their uh, yeah. home openers and all, all that yeah. pomp and circumstance down there. Uh, hopefully we're going to come back home with a very good series win. Yeah. And we come back to Trustmark Park for 13 games in 14 days uh, starting on Tuesday. 12 games in 13 days. 12 games in 13 mm-hmm. That's right, six, six and six is 12. <laughs> that's why I went to journalism school. Hey, I'm not math. If, if I know what today is, that's a win for me right now <laughs> with, with, with everything. But, but, yeah, we're back 12 games in 13 days. And a great homestand of uh, giveaways too, right? Yeah, we'll have, I think that first Friday night, um, we're going to have uh, the first 1,000 fans getting a Dansby Swanson replica of Mississippi Braves jersey. And then that following Friday night, we'll be doing our Jackson Generals throwback where all the fans will get the old Jackson Mississippi Generals. I always say Mississippi because of being with the Tennessee there was Generals. another, yeah. Um, Mississippi Generals uh, hats on their way through the gates of first 1,000 fans. So uh, that'll be a lot of fun to Why uh, do to I have a feeling, here. though, that on Friday night, the 21st, it's going to be a thousand ladies just standing in line first to get the Dansby jersey. I just I don't know why that would be. I, I there's almost not every day somebody comes in and sees all the pictures in our office. And like, where's where's the Dansby Swanson? <laughs> <laughs> well, why do you say that? I have no idea. And it just seems like on Mother's Day they all want yeah. Dansby. What is what's going on? So. But but I think you know for fans that they come back and and I think they're you know we heard obviously you know positives and negatives and I think both are important to hear you know after after a series you know there's things that you know as a staff we we need to work on we need to get solidified and there's some things that I think we can really build on too and you know I think for most of it's 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 just kind of reminding ourselves this is still unprecedented times and you know we haven't done this in two years so it's going to continue to build and get better and better but we feed so much off the fan support and 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 that's that's been huge. Hey, so if you want to, make sure now, get your tickets for the the series against the Chattanooga Lookouts on Tuesday the 18th. I know we're going to have Bark in the Park when we come home. Bring your dog. Actually, just a little heads up, uh, this week, either today or tomorrow, we're going to announce a pooch pack, which will give you a Bark in the Park season ticket for every Bark in the Park night, the remaining nine Bark in the Park nights for the remainder of the season. I think it's going to be right around 50 bucks for you and your pooch to come to every uh, one of our Bark in the Park games from here on out. Excellent. So the, the human pays, the dog we don't require to pay. Who's who's going to be walking, working the pooper scooper around the park? Does anybody have that job yet? Uh, you are. Whatever it takes. <laughs> Whatever it takes. That's a lot of fun. I can't wait to have Bark in the Park back. And then, uh, yeah, first responder night once again. First, responder uh, first responders can come in on Wednesday nights with a get a free ticket mm-hmm. uh, with their ID. Yeah. Thursdays and healthcare workers. And yeah. healthcare workers. Well, they are absolutely first responders, yeah. as we've learned in COVID. We, we actually, even during the busy first homestand, we were able to go out to uh, to St. Dominic's and do another one of those hot dog happy hours for their employees. I think that's something that last year when we didn't have a season, really a lot of us, you know, fed off that energy was, you know, going there and, you know, providing them a, a meal, a hot dog, and provide that baseball atmosphere, bring trusty, bring, you know, a couple of the mascots out. And even through that busy homestand, we got out to St. Dominic's on Friday and was able to give them a hot dog happy hour. That's and awesome. That's going to continue. You know, we're going to continue to do that and, and uh, you know, have our presence in the community because, you know, we, we always go by this as the community's team. And, you know, we're an asset to, to the city and, and hopefully and, and to the entire central Mississippi region, and we hope they consider the same for us. And those are good new hot dogs, too. I'll tell you what. Kayam. Kayam hot dogs. The, the, they are the same hot dogs that are served at Fenway Park in Boston. And, of course, they are renowned for their hot dogs yeah. at Fenway Park in Boston. So I even had the uh, the, the accent there for Boston. You know, so. <laughs> but they're good. I, it, they're all beef. They're all beef hot dogs. And... Uh, you know, the, try one really when you get good. out to the park. I won before the game on Sunday. So yeah. it, I had the best broadcast on Sunday. So I had had to be the hot dog. Well, and we won again. So that's. And we won. That's yeah. exactly right. There you go. Uh, so let's see. Then we'll have Thirsty Thursday, mm-hmm. which went over big on the first Thirsty yeah, Thursday. And, and, and on Thursdays, it was really cool to see all the activity out 
kind of the plaza area there by the Farm Bureau Grill. We had cornhole going out there. Uh, we had trivia. Central Mississippi Trivia is going to be doing trivia every Thursday night out there in the in the grill. And that I is think, a cool new bar out yeah, there. Oh, you have that 360 degree bar with a you know lookout of of to the field and full service bar um, and all those baseball cards up underneath yeah the... yeah there's even one of my business cards with my cell phone on it i think <laughs> i think out there but <laughs> but, but no it, it was it, it was cool to see and i think that'll continue to build as the year goes on but i tell you you sit out there at that uh that's one of the uh, nicest amenities i've seen in a minor league ballpark you get that kind of major league feel sitting in there and and, and looking out it's like being in the chop house it really is yeah it really is so, and then Friday night, we'll have the Dansby Swanson mm -hmm. giveaway. Saturday, fireworks again. That's right. What a show that was this past we, Saturday. We had fireworks with two Langoliers home runs and then the actual fireworks, which they never disappoint. No, it was really, really good. And then next Sunday, you know, hopefully it's kids' day. Hopefully they'll get to run the bases. Mother Nature That's kept true. them from doing it on That's the first true. Sunday. Is the... could have had tarp slides, I guess. <laughs> that would have been awesome. That would have been awesome. Yeah. Everybody signed a waiver. Everybody... Yeah. But that was, you know, it was a rain-shortened game, mm -hmm. and I know the kids went home disappointed, but they'll be able to come back. Yeah. Every Friday and Sunday game, kids run the bases, presented by Game on Wheels. I think that was something that was one of the more cool things to see when you looked out there and you saw the kids running the bases after the game. You're like, oh, that, that's minor league base. That was almost a record number yeah. of kids we had. Uh, and it, and of course, if you're part of our kids club, which is free to join, just go to MississippiBraves.com. Um, you get to be first in line on Fridays and Sundays for kids run the bases. Plus, you get some cool stuff, complimentary tickets to every Sunday home game. Awesome. Well, I hope you enjoy your time in Biloxi. <laughs> I spent three years there. It's a it's a wonderful place, and uh, I look forward to seeing a lot of old friends there. But I just hope we take, uh, you know, five out of six, or maybe all six from them. Bring us home with going over five hundred, right? <laughs> That'd be unbelievable. They dropped five of six to Birmingham. They were in pretty much every game. Of course, one guy that maybe some folks around here would be familiar with in that Biloxi rotation is Ethan Small. Mm. He was the ace, of course, for Mississippi State, a first round pick of the Milwaukee Brewers. I think we'll see him on Thursday, I believe. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. Ethan's actually from my hometown in, in, in Lexington, Tennessee, ironically enough. So I'm looking forward to seeing him start. Uh, I told him I'd root for him, uh, except for when he's on the mound against us. But uh, that'll be cool to see him because I think he's he's going to have a bright future uh, coming out of Mississippi, Mississippi State. Well, tune into all the games. He'll have the action for you on 103.9 WYAB uh, or at MississippiBraves.com. And then we will hopefully see you at the ballpark. If the people want to get tickets, best way to do it. Yeah, MississippiBraves.com. We continue to encourage fans to, to, to do mobile ticketing. It's so easy when you, when you buy your tickets online. You know, they'll send you an email and you have your barcode right on your phone. And you just walk to the gate and they scan your barcode. You come on in. So it keeps that. But if you like the paper tickets, you know, you can always come by the, the box office. But come by the box office. It's open Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. MississippiBraves.com, Ticketmaster.com, and get those tickets in advance because you really save from the game day price. And then if there was a rain out like we had on Sunday, you can always use those tickets for a future game as well. Um, so you always have the opportunity to, if you have a tickets that gets, that gets rained out, you can always use it for a future game. Excellent. It's great to have baseball back. Chris. It is. It is. <laughs> we're, we're all slowly and, and maybe not smoothly at times getting back out into things, but you know, I can't say enough about you and, and, and the staff here at the City of Pearl, Frank, Greg, everybody, uh, you know, for, uh, for what you guys have done for us because uh, you guys are clutch. And, and uh, you know, we put you guys sometimes in some even tough positions, you know, to help make things work. But uh, it's a great partnership like that. We love having you all here. They are the Mississippi Braves. We like to call them Pearl's team, but really we'll share them with the rest of the state too. All right, when we come back. We will see. And Josh, you. by the way. I want to th thank Josh. Too. Oh, we, we can never forget Josh. Yes. What our biggest especially baseball fan. Especially thank here. Josh, yeah. We will especially thank Josh. All right, he Chris. took some great photos the other day, by the way. Excellent. Excellent. All right, folks, that'll do it for this edition of Embrace Insider. We will see you out at Trustmark Park on the next homestand.
Come find your taste buds at the Lost Cajun. Chef Charles is cooking everything to order. Cajun classics like gumbo, jambalaya, and red beans and rice. Pick your po' boy, shrimp, oyster, roast beef, or maybe gator. Proudly serving USDA farm-raised catfish. When you're done, loosen the belt up a bit for some homemade beignets. Dine in, take out, order online, and get it delivered. Reserve our party room for your group. Find your way to the Lost Cajun in Pearl and Byram. Well, before we go, we want to pass along just one more cool accolade for you. Uh, we had a law enforcement prayer breakfast on Thursday morning, and it is Law Enforcement Week. And here in Pearl, we absolutely love all of our men and women that serve in law enforcement, as well as all of Rankin County in the state and across the country. It was a great prayer service, as well as uh, the mayor and the police chief wanted to recognize uh, to somewhat commemorate the dark day on May 1st, 2012, when we lost Detective Mike Walter uh, in the line of duty. So he was honored once again, and it's hard to believe that that was nine years ago, but uh, a fitting tribute to a very fitting man, Detective Mike Walter, uh, that we lost in the line of duty on May 1st, 2012. Well, that's going to do it for today's show. I want to thank uh, Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman, Senator Dean Kirby immensely for that great interview. Chris Harris with the Mississippi Braves. We look forward to getting out to Trustmark Park this season in some beautiful weather and watching some baseball. That's going to do it for this edition. Remember, folks, there's a reason why Pearl is called the jewel of the crossroads.